All right. We're going to go to an episode that pretty much disturbed me in season two of Re Zero, Starting Life in Another World, where it's titled The Witch's Tea Party. Echidna explained, who is the witch of greed? So, first of all, I found Echidna to be very distasteful. I found her to be untrustworthy. I found her to be very disgusting. And I couldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. And you know what? I just didn't want to throw her an inch, okay? She is somebody I don't trust. So, this is from Annie News. So, let's go ahead and check this video out. Please support the original content creator. But also, folks, again, you know, you can pour yourself a cup of tea or have a glass of wine. And that's what I'm going to do because I don't trust the Witch of Greed and neither should you. So let's play this video in a three, two, and an uno. Echidna's tea party was probably the most important event from this episode. While I do believe that they did a great job adapting it, I think they could have done a bit more to explain what exactly was going on. Yeah. In the novels, Subaru actually asked a few noteworthy questions and got some interesting answers in return. So, as we go through today's cut content, we'll learn more about who this Witch of Greed really is and why she invited Subaru to her tea party. Aside from that though, Episode 3 also skipped some of the most important details regarding Sanctuary so far. There was a whole bunch of cut scenes regarding Frederica's suspected involvement with everyone's captivity, plus the introduction of a brand new character who should have been revealed towards the end. In addition to all of that, there was also the exclusion of an entire group within Sanctuary that seeks to do harm to Amelia. These were fairly important topics that should have been included in this episode. So let's continue our cut content series and take a look at what exactly we missed out on. Before we get into the cut content though, this video is sponsored by Surfshark. My per Protect yourself on the internet, folks. The internet's a fun place, but it's filled with vile, evil people too. Personal go-to VPN for when I'm trying to bypass region-blocked anime on Netflix. You'd be surprised by how many more anime there are in places like Singapore and Thailand. So, by using surfshark.deal slash Annie News, you can now get 85% off a two-year plan plus an additional three free months, providing all your devices with one of the most secure VPNs on the market, complete with their numerous features. The one that I personally use the most is the Clean Web Tool, which clears your browser of all ads, trackers, and malware. But there's also other things like the Camouflage Mode, which hides all your usage from your internet provider, or even the Hack Lock, which gives you real-time alerts of when your data may be compromised. And there's plenty more that goes towards keeping your location and sensitive data safe. So if you're interested in a more secure and versatile online experience, then go ahead and use surfshark.deal slash news or the link in the description to get that 85% discount today. Now, let's get back to the video. Mm. Episode 28, The Long-Awaited Reunion, covering chapter 2 to chapter 3 of volume 10 of the light novel. Because Subaru had experienced death numerous times before, he felt that he had gained a fairly keen sense for danger. It wasn't so strong that it would prevent him from dying more often, but it did grant him a certain level of awareness while in situations like this one. It's for this reason that he was able to sense that the girl sitting before him was a far greater threat than- Yep, yep, looking at her already, you just gotta get the f run, be like, you know what, thanks for the tea party, I gotta run. And both the white whale and sloth. So, considering this was a situation that he had literally no control over, Subaru had no other choice but to accept whatever invitation it was that Echidna was offering. An invitation to have a conversation. Their first topic of discussion turned out to be your bodily fluids that you just drank. ...was on how Subaru got to where he was. To clarify on what actually happened, Subaru wasn't physically moved through space but instead put under the influence of a dark spell. It was a claim that Subaru found very hard to believe. But as he looked around to see what was a surreal view of rolling hills spanning infinitely into the distance, her words began to be more believable. Now, when he sat down to drink Echidna's tea, the reveal of it being something akin to her body fluids spurred on a much more comedic conversation. Subaru dropped to his knees and tried to vomit out what he just drank, stating that he didn't want to drink anyone's fluids without being ready for it which implied that if he was prepared, then it was something that he would consider doing. Subaru only realized the perversion of this statement after he had said it aloud. So he tried to correct himself by saying that he wasn't inclined to be aroused by anyone's saliva or sweat. Ugh, jeez. She was kind of into like, oh, oh, you drank it? Well, okay, hey, I got some more for you. <laughs> At least he didn't think so anyway. In any case, once he realized that Echidna's tea wasn't coming back up, he shifted his focus towards the more concerning problem sitting in front of him. Unlike in the anime, Subaru did in fact have a few questions for Echidna. 
First, he wanted to know where exactly he was and if she truly was a witch. It didn't make sense for this person to be the Witch of Greed because Subaru knew that she along with the five other witches were all killed by the Witch of Envy. That's when Echidna explained that the ruins were actually her tomb, a grave that serves to hold her soul captive for all eternity. Where Subaru was now was simply Echidna's personal realm. Though she refers to it as her castle, it's actually something more similar to a dream. Her dream. When Subaru entered her tomb, his spirit was invited by Echidna's spirit into her dream, and he accepted. Obviously, this wasn't something Subaru thought to be possible, but the way that Echidna spoke made it seem like there was no way that she was lying. She then went on to say something that Subaru found to be rather peculiar. Apparently, this type of realm is a place that he should already be familiar with, as if to say that she knew he's been to a place similar in nature to this one. It wasn't anywhere that Subaru could personally recall, but once again Echidna didn't seem to be lying. He simply accepted that what she was saying was the truth. So when she said that this dream world wasn't something that he could simply awaken from, that's when Subaru started to realize the dire situation that he found himself in. You see, Subaru can't leave this realm without Echidna's permission. Oh. If Echidna really wanted to, she could very easily keep both his body and spirit captive forever. Luckily, that wasn't what she was planning to do. Because Subaru stumbled into her domain of his own free will, he was also free to leave whenever he wanted. The only reason he was even here at all was because Echidna was simply showing him the same hospitality that she'd show any other invited guest. If that was in fact the case, then that would mean that she had nothing to do with the crystal or Amelia. So when Subaru asked about the events that happened prior to his arrival, he was surprised to hear that she knew very little of what was happening outside her tomb. It wasn't the answer Subaru was looking for, but because there was no way of confirming it, there wasn't really much else that he could do. At the moment, that was all that Subaru wanted to know. So with no more questions to ask, he no longer had any reason to stay. His primary goal was to find Amelia. The longer he stayed here with Echidna, the longer that goal would remain unaccomplished. It may seem like he's wasting a huge opportunity here, but it's not like you can blame Subaru for being worried about Amelia. I mean, the last time he left someone he cared about alone, she ended up getting her existence removed from the world. So it makes sense that he would prioritize Amelia's safety over everything else. Yeah, of course, and Subaru, stop looking at her, dude. Come on, stay focused on your square, Subaru. Even so, the fact remained that this was a very rare opportunity. Only after Rakitina explained just how rare it was did he fully understand who it was that was sitting in front of him. The tense feeling he'd been carrying this entire encounter wasn't so much because of Echidna's threatening aura, but instead due to her insatiable curiosity. The way she looked at Subaru as if she already knew everything about him made her presence feel that much more oppressive. That's when Subaru decided to stay and ask a couple more questions. He asked, what are you and do you know the things I want to know? These were such odd questions that Echidna couldn't help but laugh at the nature of them. It was in that moment that Echidna acknowledged Subaru's own personal greed, a desire for knowledge that was very much similar to her own. As the world around him began to crumble, the darkness that took its place was something Subaru wanted no part of. He immediately knew that falling into such an abyss would lead to an inescapable end. So he paid close attention to the words Echidna spoke next. They were the unfamiliar names of the witches that were never recorded into history. When Echidna finally spoke of the Witch of Envy, the only thing Subaru could feel was a powerful aura of death. Subaru had been trying to ignore the restlessness persisting throughout his body the entire time, but ever since finding out who Echidna was, he couldn't even force himself to look in her direction. It was a natural reaction that Echidna hoped would change but personally couldn't do anything about. She simply stared at Subaru as if anticipating the moment in which he would snap out of the intense state of fear he found himself in. That's where her tea comes into play. Not only did this tea strengthen his resistance to Echidna's presence, but it also activated his Witch Factor. For those who don't want to know what a Witch Factor is, then go ahead and skip to the following timestamp. No, 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 we're gonna find this out. But if you're okay with a minor spoiler, well, Witch Factors are what enable people to use authorities. And authorities are the abilities that we see the Archbishops using. Mm. The type of authority that manifests within an individual is dependent on the person possessing it. Meaning, Subaru's authority of sloth wouldn't be the same unseen hand ability as the previous holder. Instead, it would be something more unique to Subaru's personal desires. So, the witch factor that allows people to use authorities is what Echidna activated, and it's also what qualified Subaru to enter the ruins. 
Akedina was trying to make it clear that Subaru was a very special person. To her, he was an exception among exceptions. His current path put him far ahead of schedule over what she was expecting, but he was much less aware of what was going on than what she felt he needed. For starters, he needed to know a lot more about the witches, the tomb, and even sanctuary. Akedina was speaking as if Subaru's path was one that had been planned from the very beginning. He couldn't fully understand what she was trying to say, but when she mentioned Sanctuary, that was all Subaru needed to hear in order to decide it was finally time to leave. Even though Akedina was offering literally every historical detail relating back to the time when she was alive 400 years ago, Subaru had zero interest in learning about any of it. Sure, getting to know more about the Witch Factor or Sanctuary would have been nice, but Amelia needed to be found first. When Akedina saw this, the overwhelming presence that she previously possessed had now deteriorated into nothing more than that of an ordinary girl's. But right before Subaru was about to leave, one final question of great importance popped into his head. He wanted to know if she knew anything about the witch cult's archbishops. Unfortunately, that was a term that Echidna had never heard before. It did, however, go to stir her innate curiosity. As if the roles were now reversed, Echidna wanted to hear all about these so-called archbishops. But there was no point in discussing it any further since it was clear that Akedina had no knowledge on their authorities, the damage they did, or the methods of repairing them. There was nothing that she could say that would help him save Rem, a goal that shared equal importance with the one to find Amelia. What's even more important to note was that Akedina just showed that she has nothing to do with the witch's cult. If that is in fact true, then it makes you wonder where exactly the witch cult is getting their powers from. Anyway, as Subaru was about to leave through the portal, we know that Akedina's compensation was a formal pact to never speak of their little tea party. What wasn't mentioned after this was when Akedina stated that Subaru was already bound by a pact of a similar nature. Akedina felt that Subaru should have no problem following her pact since it's one that he already has experience with. Once again, Subaru had no idea what Akedina was talking about, but the way she spoke as if she was referring to a forbidden topic made it seem as if she was describing return by death. Perhaps his inability to talk about that was due to the very same pact that he was making here with Echidna. Yeah. These are all subtle hints to mysteries that are slowly being unraveled, stuff that wasn't included in the anime. In any case, that was the witch's tea party as it took place in the novels. From it, we learned that Echidna is the Witch of Greed who personally possesses an insatiable hunger for knowledge. It's her boundless curiosity towards the unknown that seems to define her greed. For the past 400 years, the ruins have served as Echidna's grave in which her soul is forever trapped. Only those who possess a witch factor may enter and potentially gain access to her seemingly infinite knowledge from the era of witches. Learning anything else isn't something she can offer since she doesn't seem to know much about the current period, which is rather weird considering that she seems to know almost everything about Subaru. That as well as who Echidna was before she ended up trapped are mysteries that will end up being solved later. Now let's move on to the rest of the episode. The reason Garfield knew exactly where Subaru was was because he had used his nose to track Subaru's scent. He wasn't tracking the smell that everyone typically attributes to the witch, but instead a normal one that Garfield wasn't familiar with. That's how he knew there were outsiders within Sanctuary. You see, Garfield is a demi-human- See Garfield, our boy who eats lasagna! ...related by blood to Frederica. So it makes sense that his physical strength and senses- and it curses upon you, Garfield, for hurting our boy Otto. I, I see our boy Otto right there. Garfield, I'm so glad our boy Otto, who likes to get blato, owned you, man. ...are much better than the average person. Now, while in the carriage on the way to Sanctuary, we got to learn a bit more about Garfield and Frederica's relationship. The two didn't seem to get along too well. Any sort of conversation that brought up Frederica's name just made Garfield want to disregard it as quickly as possible. It was clear that he didn't want anything to do with her. And based on the way that Frederica spoke about Garfield, that seemed to be the case for her as well. The two of them were just living in their own separate worlds. Garfield then shifted the topic to the place known as Sanctuary. While talking about it, he referred to it once as the Tomb of the Witch of Greed. This was a term that neither Otto nor Subaru had ever heard before. In fact, Subaru didn't even know that other witches aside from the Witch of Envy existed at all likely due to a side effect from the pact that he made with Echidna. So Garfield went on to explain how Envy supposedly killed all the other witches by eating them, because there wasn't yeah. much left with regard oh, gee. I'm kinda looking at you, Amelia. regards to historical records on the matter, no one is actually really sure how they died. What they do know for sure though is that after Envy was the only witch left, 
the world was led into a state of terror like no one had ever seen before. That being the case, the witch cult became devout followers of Envy and Envy alone. They refused to acknowledge the existence of any other witches. Even hearing the mention of any of their names is enough to send the- Let's see, Daphne, Camellia, Minerva, Ganymed, Typhon, Echidna. ...cult on a destructive rampage. To clarify what that meant, Garfield mentioned a southern city in the Valachia Empire that started spreading rumors of a different witch. Supposedly a media that previously belonged to her had been discovered. Eventually this caused a witch that wasn't Envy to gain prominence in the area. Something that the witch cult wouldn't allow. Ugh, God. Wait, hey, wait, wait, what's, what's Attack on Titan doing here? Even though this city was one of the most fortified in Valachia, a single archbishop was all that was needed to destroy it. All because of these newly spread rumors of heresy. Sure enough, the city and all its people were completely wiped out. That's why it became prohibited to speak of the witches at all. It was too dangerous to discuss anything related to them, especially if you weren't talking about the Witch of Envy. Anyway, that was all the information that Garfield could offer. Anything else would have to be gotten from Roswell. Which brings us now to when they arrived at Sanctuary. The only difference from the encounter with Ram was with what happened after. As Ram was taking them to go see Roswell, Amelia didn't let go of Subaru's hand. Instead, she continued to hold it as she walked beside him. A minor detail that I'm sure a lot of you Amelia fans would appreciate. Now, when the two arrived to see Roswell in such a sorry state, all sorts of- You know what you should have done? Grab some metal baseball bats and beat Roswell to death with them, okay? I don't care about his sob story. Beat him within an inch of his life. Topics came up into the conversation. But the one that didn't make it into the anime was the one about what happened to Subaru. Subaru took a few moments to explain how Amelia was supposed to be the one teleported to the ruins instead of him. The only plausible explanation for this was that Frederica had planned for this to happen. It was fair to assume that she knew the barrier would render Amelia unconscious, then the crystal would have her teleported into the forest. This hypothesis was only further reinforced when Ram mentioned that the crystal wasn't even necessary to bypass the barrier. So Frederica was undoubtedly scheming something. It was clear that she was deeply involved with the present situation that everyone currently found themselves in. A situation that both Amelia and Subaru initially assumed to be because of Garfield. Before anyone could clear this false assumption, it was then that Garfield walked into the room which triggered a fairly tense moment. Amelia looked as if she was ready to start fighting Garfield right there. And it didn't help- That's right, take that you lasagna eating bastard. ...that Garfield was always ready to accept a fight either. Only after Ram stepped in and smashed an iron tray over his head- Good. Well done, Ram. Even though Ram is far superior. ...did everyone calm down. You'd think that a hot-tempered person like him wouldn't let this slide, but Ram seemed to be the only person who could keep Garfield under control. It was actually fairly common to see Garfield lower his guard around her. Only after Subaru saw the way that Garfield looked at her did he realize that Garfield had to think for Ram. Yeah, but she don't like you. She likes the creepy clown guy. Sorry, G Garfield, she's not yours. Garfield, Garfield, she was never yours. And she never will be yours. I'm so sorry, dude. She's interested in the creepy clown guy. When Subaru brought it up, Garfield didn't even try to deny it. Instead, he just found it normal for him to be attracted to her. In any case, since brute force wasn't the cause of their imprisonment, that meant the only thing left that could be responsible for keeping them there was the barrier. That was only partially right though. There were a couple other factors contributing to their confinement. To clarify what was mentioned in the anime, the barrier doesn't mean much to anyone who isn't a half-blood. Both Roswell and Subaru could pass through it whenever they like. The reason Roswell didn't was because Garfield wouldn't let any of the other villagers leave until he broke the barrier. But now that Amelia herself was a prisoner, everyone was now in the same boat. Now, you'd think that they could just carry all the half-bloods out of the barrier, but unfortunately that wasn't an option either. To explain more on why that was, a pink-haired elf girl appeared at the front door of Roswell's house. She inserted herself into the conversation to explain that any half-blood who tries to leave the barrier would just become a soulless husk. Initially, Subaru thought that this was the same elf girl from the episode before, but as he was about to ask if she was, Ram quickly intervened to get him to stop talking. For some ah. reason, she didn't want him to mention the elven girl he saw earlier. At least- Jesus Christ, Ram, can you not be an ass? Not while this other elf was around, anyway. She introduced herself as the village's representative, an elder who goes by the name of Ryuzu Bilma. 
Subaru figured that it was only a matter of time before he would eventually come across the lolly hag stereotype. Sure enough, there was now one standing right in front of him. It was pretty weird to see Ryuzu's mature demeanor clash with her younger appearance. Neither Amelia nor Subaru knew the best way to respond to her. I mean, even the way she acted on the outside made it seem as if she was an older woman. In any case, the reason for her appearance was to explain the manner in which the barrier capped Half-Bloods trapped. When someone like Amelia comes into contact with the barrier, it's not entirely accurate to say that she'll just lose consciousness. It's more correct to say that it's her very soul being repelled from her body. If she tries to force her way past the barrier, then her soul will be separated from her body and her body will become nothing more than an empty shell. So, given that the barrier was harmless to regular people meant that Roswell's injuries were still unexplained. Yes, it's true that Garfield's- Yeah, yeah, Roswell's an asshole. There you go. Never mind. Physical strength is more than enough to deal this level of damage to Roswell. But the root cause of his severe wounds was nothing more than Roswell just being unqualified to take the trial. Those who try to do so yet don't have mixed blood would end up having their flesh repelled and shredded. All the bandages and blood were finally starting to make sense now. There were numerous lacerations across Roswell's upper body as if he'd stood in front of a massive explosion. Good. Finally. I'm glad he knows some kind of pain, lousy creep. It also didn't help that the wounds showed very little improvement when exposed to healing magic. Subaru couldn't understand why Roswell would even attempt this. To him, no normal person would expose themselves to such danger while already knowing the outcome. Perhaps he felt it was his duty as the Lord to at least try. If anything though, Roswell's actions made it perfectly clear that the trial needed to be treated with the utmost caution. After Amelia gained the support of the villagers at the cathedral, the conversation between Ram and Subaru went on a little bit longer. At first, they were wondering if Frederica had planned for Amelia to be the one to enter the ruins. If that was what she truly intended, then Subaru could only wonder what terrible fate awaited her had she gone in there alone. It was this topic that brought forth something a bit more secretive. To make sure no one around them would hear, Ram whispered into Subaru's ear a rather shocking bit of information. Not everyone who lives in Sanctuary wants to be freed from it. There's a small minority who find comfort from the shelter the barrier provides. It's possible that Frederica could have been working with them in order to foil the plan to remove the barrier. Just the possibility of that being the case made Subaru worried that perhaps he left Rem and Petra in the hands of someone who couldn't be trusted. Oh. Fortunately, Ram was confident that Frederica would never go so far as to harm anyone in the mansion. That just wasn't the type of person she was. The main concern needed to be had with those who wanted to prevent Amelia from dispelling the barrier. They would be the ones that would try to harm her. Ram wasn't sure who they were, but the fact remained that they needed to be wary of this so-called anti-liberation faction. In addition to all of this, there was also the concern of the pink-haired elf that looked exactly like Ryuzu. Subaru wanted to know why she was being kept hidden. Unfortunately, that wasn't something Ram was allowed to answer yet. As night began to fall, the time for Amelia's trial drew closer. It was necessary to have several witnesses during such an event. So, Garfield and Ryuzu were there to represent Sanctuary. Ram was there as Roswell's proxy, and Subaru was there as Amelia's retainer. When Amelia entered the ruins, Subaru turned to both Ryuzu and Garfield to ask why they'd never attempted the trial themselves. Technically, they were eligible to take the trial, but that didn't mean that they were capable of liberating Sanctuary. You see, both Garfield and Ryuzu were restrained by a never-ending pact that binds them to this place. This was yet another example of how others treated pacts and oaths with great significance. Hmm. Even though Subaru found it to be a hindrance, it was a recurring topic that he just couldn't seem to avoid. Anyway, that pretty much brings us to the end of episode 3. There was definitely a lot of stuff worth covering this time. So, if you enjoyed learning more about the ReZero story, then be sure to leave a like or comment to show your support. It really does help the video to do better. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank Surfshark once again for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a highly reliable... Yeah, trust your Surfshark. Alright, so I think we learned a couple of things here. First of all, you cannot trust any of the witches. You can't trust any of those people. Absolutely. And now, look, I know a couple of people will say, well, gee, you know, uh, you saw the end of the se uh, season two. And yes, I did. Yes, I did. But however, 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 uh, the witch... The Witch of Greed and all these other witches and everyone else is playing all these uh, crazy stuff. But by the way, uh, the tea party took place in like the default Windows background, okay? So if anyone uses default Windows background, you know they're evil. Pure evil to the hundredth uh, degree. But I, I, I would say that the anime would have made more sense 
if they had the full conversation between Subaru and Echidna. Um, Echidna just being indifferent, like, yeah, that's, 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 that's my bodily fluids right there. That would not be, um, that would be cash money to me, which is something I don't approve of. So there you go. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this was a great video to talk about and also give a breakdown about, you know, uh, who Subaru is and what he was dealing with and also what was cut off from the main anime. I am ever, ever hopeful for a season three of Ray Zero starting life in another world. In fact, let's see. Ray Zero season three. That's a release date. Let's see if there will be a release date. Will there be? Oh, <gasps> yo, there will be. October 2024. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's really awesome. Okay, so I learned something new. I In Halloween, too. Oh, my God. I don't think I'm ready for this anarchy. It'll be in Halloween. Heavens help us.